can go low or they can go high. Some of them spin slow, while others rotate faster. But if you're the best in the world on the water, you belong at the Masters. The conditions are perfect here at Callaway Gardens. A slight overcast and then a slight ripple across the waters of Robin Lake. The Masters is a rare professional event because it includes all three of the major disciplines of water skiing plus wakeboarding. You're going to see the power of slalom and the finesse of trick skiing as well as the high flying huge air of wakeboarding. But first we go to jumping and jumping in the form of ski flying. Now 300 is a magic number in many sports. A perfect game in bowling is 300. A batter who has a 300 average never sits on the bench and a pitcher with 300 wins is on his way to the Hall of Fame. Well in ski flying 300 would represent a world record. The record right now 299 feet. Can you imagine someone sailing the length of a football field over the waters of Robin Lake? Well we go to my partner Joel McClintock, former world overall champion, to find out where we stand after the prelims. Dave, these guys are not just knocking on the door of 300 feet, they're ready to knock the door down. And the two favorites have got to be Freddy the Nightmare on Jump Street Kruger, who has a personal best of 294 feet. And of course, we're looking forward to seeing world record holder Jarrett Llewellyn in action, who two weeks ago at the Crackcraft Big Air Challenge came within one foot of that elusive 300 foot mark. And if the preliminaries are any indication, we may see that 300 foot mark go down here at the Masters. Here's how they stand after the preliminary round with Llewellyn in the lead, followed by Kruger. Let's go back now and look at the longest flight from that preliminary qualifying round. Jarrett Llewellyn leaping an impressive 285 feet while mom Chris looks on rather nervously. Jarrett really did his thing up off the ramp, right over top of the skis, great looking flight. A couple weeks ago, we were in the 90s, and um, that's just every weekend, we're learning a little bit more, we're pushing each other a little bit more, and. Um, Definitely, it's, it's there. Having a headwind is critical for hitting 300 feet, but there's only a mild breeze right now on that Australian flag. Ozzy Bruce Neville is our first flyer on the water. He's already done two jumps. Of course, speed is an important aspect of this event, boat speed in particular. Dave had a chance to have a look at the boat that will be pulling these competitors. When a ski flyer flies 300 feet through the air, no doubt all eyes are on the skier. But the truth is the other end of the story is equally important. 105 feet ahead of that skier is this engine box, and under the engine box is a 5.4 liter supercharged engine. You see, we needed an engine that could act like a tractor and a sports car at the same time. So CorrectCraft went together with PCM, the Vistian Corporation, and Ford Power Products to put together this concept engine. It's the same engine you find in the Ford Lightning pickup truck. 5.4 liters supercharged, it's the first time we've ever used a supercharged engine in a tournament ski boat. The reason being that when these skiers turn those big skis and lock into their cut, the boat has to hold a solid 45 miles an hour. But when they leave the ramp at 70 miles an hour, we need a boat that can act like a sports car and accelerate up to 55 miles per hour to keep the skier from outrunning the boat. Bruce Neville, four different times he has won this event. He's also a two-time world champion. And of course, skis at home with his wife, Tony. And on many occasions, you'll see the two of them coaching each other. Here's Bruce on the dock earlier in the jump finals for women. He's coaching her right now. Look at this. He's saying, keep your skis on edge into the bottom of the ramp. Well, David seems to be working. Tony managed 165 feet on this jump. Look at this turn into the bottom of the rear end of the jump. Lots of speed, lots of lift off the top, 165 feet, but not quite far enough. Earlier, Emma Shears managed 170 to take the lead. Emma Shears from Australia. What a powerful jumper she has always been, but not often having very good luck here at the Masters. But she kicked off a winning jump of 170 feet for a new course record. We went to the dock and caught up with Emma. I haven't had a win here for quite a few years, about five years. So I'm just so excited to have jumped well today and to have taken it out. So here are the results. Emma Shears obviously winning Tony Nibble in second and Britta Llewellyn coming in third. So now Bruce is back on the water for jump number three. He's got the 247, the 181. What does he need to do here, Joel? Bruce is known for his power and carries a ton of speed into the ramp, but slips out, does not get the distance he's looking for at that time. And it's interesting that Bruce is one of the innovators of the ski flying event. He was one of the guys who said, let's go farther. 
just a bit of slip with the skis, lost a lot of height because of it, not the jump he was looking for. And you can see from his expression right there, Bruce is not satisfied. While it was a foot farther, 248 feet, and it makes him the leader. But look at the ramp speed, 73.8 miles an hour off the top of the ramp. And here comes Bruce back to the dock, and we'll be back in just a moment. ESPN's coverage of the 41st Masters is brought to you by Ford Outfitters, no boundaries. By Ford Power Products, the source for power worldwide. And by Rolex, the watch of champions the world over. Oh, there's a giant crowd here at Callaway Gardens. They line the beach every year to watch their favorite champions on the water. Let's go down to the dock where Joel has caught up with Bruce Nibble. Bruce, there was no lack of speed out there. What's it feel like to hit the ramp at 76 miles per hour? Yeah, I had the speed on that one. I tell you what, it's, it's, it's pretty frightening. Uh, you know, I haven't had that much speed in practice. I've been a little bit slower than that. So I thought, man, I looked at the scoreboard, it said 76. And I thought, man, if I can get my legs on this, that'd be awesome. But uh, having trouble getting the legs, getting the lift, not happy. Scott Ellis takes to the water right now, the 28-year-old. A little earlier, we asked him about the difference between ski flying and jumping. It's like traditional jumping, uh, except for the pitcher does change a little bit because you're further away from the ramp because you're using a 105-foot rope. But it's, uh, it's a small window of opportunity that you got to look for, and once you see it, you know, you got to seize it and get that quick acceleration up to almost 80 miles an hour. Scott has a jump of 268 on the board right now. Here he comes for the next attempt. This counter cut's so important, he's got to get wide here in order to develop his speed to the ramp. Well, Dave, Scott has been known as the rocket man for good reason. He's watched this guy blast off the top of the jump, up over the skis, looking good. He's going to like that one. Just under three seconds of hang time, and three is the magic number. These jumpers want to be in the air longer than three seconds. Look at how low he is as he comes into the bottom, but pushes off the top, maximizing his lift right up over the skis to take advantage of the flight, the lift on the skis themselves. Well, the radar gun has him at 72.4 miles an hour. So he wants to get the speed up a little bit, and he wants to hang a little bit longer on his third and final jump. A great second jump, but Scott is not done yet. And of course, distance is what it's all about. Dave had a chance to find out just how they measure that distance. It's pretty impressive to watch one of these ski flyers sail almost 300 feet across the open waters of Robin Lake. But you may be wondering, well, how do we measure those jumps? How do we know exactly how far the jumper went? Back in the late 40s, when the daredevils of ski jumping first started, the distances were like 50 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet. Well, six guys with yardsticks could run along the beach and plant poles in the ground and then sight across the lake to see, well, I think he went 50 or 60 feet. Today, we rely on technology that gets the measurement right down to the tenth of a meter. To do, to do that, we use video imaging, a screen that's designed to freeze the image of the skier as he lands on the water. And then we ask the computer system to count the pixels in the picture that line up with his landing position. If you watch this screen, there's our jumper, and he landed right there. We do the calculations, and the computer says that was a jump of 281 feet, only 19 feet short of the length of a football field. Technology amazing, but so is the technology on the water. Scott Ellis relying on these skis and his own strength right now. Well, Scott coming in for his last attempt, and he is in the groove today. Two great opening jumps, lots of speed for this last one. Let's see how much hang time he get in on that Rolex hang time clock. 75.7 miles per hour, but he's still under the three-second mark. Well, it doesn't get any prettier than this, Dave. Right up over the skis, nice flight, but not as much speed as he would have needed to uh, push out into the 280s. Scott bouncing along on the backside of that speed suit, which also helps the distance increase. He's at 277 feet, a little bit of an increase. And Scott comes back to the dock wondering if that will be enough to hold off the challengers. And look who's standing on the dock waiting to go next. Last year's Masters champion, Freddy Krueger. Welcome back to Callaway Gardens. We're at the 41st Masters in the middle of a very intense ski flying event. The cameras are out because Freddy Krueger is on the water. And this guy is exciting. He won the event last year. He's 25 years old, still considers himself a young man in this event. Watch him develop his cut into the base of the ramp. A lot of edge right into the base, 
and look at this lift. There it is, he's over three seconds. Dave, this was a phenomenal jump. As you said, big lift off the top, and then he got a second lift that carried him way up there, gave him that extra float at 3.30 on the hang time clock and 76.2 miles per hour. And there's the distance, 284 feet, and Jarrett Llewellyn looks a little pensive on the dock. Well, you know, Dave, mixed feelings in this situation. I mean, certainly it's great that they're going far out there, conditions are right, but uh, Jarrett certainly knows he's got his work cut out for him, too. Let's watch Freddie now on this next attempt, the second of three, trying to add more distance. Another beautiful lift. He is so consistent off the top of the ramp. Again, 3.14 seconds, riding out a tough landing. Dave, even more speed on this jump for Freddie as he comes into the bottom of the jump. And again, that huge lift off the top, right up over the skis, creating even more float, much like the snow ski jumpers. Bit of trouble on the landing, mind you, but Freddie is a survivor, and he's uh, back on top of the skis, and he'll get credit for that 289-foot jump. And you can hear the crowd reacting because we know that OJ Propeller has put up a bonus for the longest jump of the day. Will that be it? We asked Freddie earlier, what is he thinking about when he sets up for the jump? There's not a whole lot of thought process going on. Basically, I want the time from the second wake to the ramp to be as fast as possible so that my ramp impact is a reaction, not a planned attack. Well, it better be a reaction because things are happening fast right here. Oh, you saw him sliding out a little bit. What was he doing there, Joel, in midair? Well, that point just playing a little bit, Dave. He knew that one wasn't going to work, so he had some fun with it. 218 feet, and Jarrett Llewellyn, along with son Dorian, sitting on the dock, getting ready for his attempts. As he leaves the dock, you know, we've talked many times about how fast the towboat has to go. That's also a challenge for the driver to handle all that horsepower. Let's go to Les Todd for a comment. It's very important to get the speed up to right at 45 miles an hour for the flyer uh, because they're cutting at such a critical, you know, precise time and they're trying to time it right on the ramp that if I'm not doing my job and really staying on my toes, then they're, you know, they're not going to be where they need to be, you know, when they get on the ramp. Speed management and lift management. That's the challenge for Jarrett Llewellyn. He has quick legs. He's very explosive off the top. Look at this. It's a great start. He's way down the lake, but the float time a little short, Joel. Yes, and Dave, if you looked at the speed, 76.3 miles per hour, but didn't get the float because he didn't get up off the jump as we saw Freddie earlier. So uh, he'll be ready to build on that one. Jared did have the top score coming into the finals with 285 feet, but of course it has now been eclipsed by Freddy Krueger's 289 foot jump. And Dave has caught up with the nightmare on Jump Street at the dock. Freddie, it looked like your kick was serving you well. You've always gotten off the top of the ramp so well. Anything missing? I mean, 289. Uh, that was a lot of jump right there. That was, uh, that's probably the best I've come off the ramp ever. Uh, the wind isn't all that favorable, but you never know what Jared's gonna do. It's still obviously very nice. and. Uh, I didn't leave much open on that. He's going to have to get it. Well, Jared looked good on jump number one, but he's got his work cut out for him. 289 feet by Freddy Krueger is the mark to beat. Jared, lots of speed into the jump. Too much, possibly. Slipped right off the side. Skis up in the air. Certainly not what he was looking for. Britta Llewellyn and son Dorian standing by, hoping for the best. Jared having to recalculate here a little bit. It's almost as if he's trying too hard, Joel. He's got all the speed, but not getting the lift. That's certainly true, Dave. Jared is sometimes at his best when he's going easy, and he certainly wasn't going easy at it that time. 76.2 miles per hour, but only 190 feet. Britta, very pensive, watching on the dock here, trying to be encouraging, a little coaching. The hand signal is so very important coming from the dock, because sometimes the jumper doesn't really understand maybe what's happening to him while he's on the water, and a confidant on shore passes on a little information. Style being so important, we asked Jarrett about his. My style is a little bit different than the other guys. I, I stay down right through the wakes, and uh, I try to load my right hip as much as, uh, much as possible. And um, as soon as you come into the bottom, I try to, try to, it's like a tug of war. I try to snap right off that hip. Freddie watching carefully here at 70 miles an hour. Jared Llewellyn kicks one more. Is it far enough? Over three seconds of float time, that's a good sign. Another pretty picture, Joel. Look at the water as it comes off the skis, but Jared's coming back to the water a little too quickly. He's not looking happy. A much lower trajectory in that one, lots of speed. But let's look at the distance. 
281. There it is. Well, Freddy Krueger, this is the second Masters victory, is it not? It is. Uh, you know, last year was the Cinderella story. I had absolutely nothing on the board, and I hit a big one. And, uh, you know, today that win's special. Jared has been so tough all year. We've been trading on and off. A ski fly victory is particularly sweet because I think you, you, you look like you're built for this event. You know, there's, there's been a lot of uh, controversy even in the six-foot jumping about, you know, whether the little guys have the advantage or whatever. And, uh, you know, I've gone through all my life being the little runt that got beat on. It's about time I got an advantage. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks, Dave. And the results for Ski Flying. Defending champion Freddy Krueger does it again with a course record of 289 feet. Jared Malone was second, and Scott Ellis third. All the jumpers over 280 feet. Over in the midway, the wakeboarders are signing autographs. It's the hottest thing on the water right now. Young and old, anxious to jump out and try a wakeboard. And the high-flying excitement of wakeboarding will be coming up later in the show. When we return, though, we're going to go slalom skiing. Welcome back to Callaway Gardens. We're here for the 41st Masters Water Ski Tournament. Just before we hit the slalom course, we ought to go down to Joel and get an explanation about how the rope comes into play. The rope lengths for the slalom event may seem a little complicated, but it's really quite simple. The standard rope is 75 feet long, but at this level of competition, the skiers will be starting at a shorter rope length, which of course makes it even more difficult to get around the buoys. This is 22 feet off of that 75 foot rope. And as the skier makes each successful pass, the boat judge will shorten the rope by set increments, 28 off, 32 off, 35 off, and picture this. At 38 off the 75 foot line, there's only 37 feet of rope. The rope doesn't even reach the buoy. Seems impossible, doesn't it? But these masters somehow manage to do the impossible and even make it look easy. Well, we're short on rope, but not on talent. Christy Overton Johnson in the finals, along with Geraldine Jamin from France, Karen Trulove from the US of A, and of course, Tony Nibble, who is our first competitor. Earlier, we asked Tony about her particular slalom style. I like to try and get as wide as I can for my gate, and then in my approach into every ball, all I want to do is think about being nice and wide on the ball, and as I come and complete the turn, I want to get onto that pull as quickly as I possibly can, so that I can accelerate out of the turn and across the weights into the next ball. The rope length is 38 off. It's very short rope. She's trying to get around the third buoy. Whoa, and the slack gets her right there after the turn. Trouble at ball three, Dave. She got that handle up a little bit high, got it stayed on the tail of the ski out of the turn, and that just doesn't work. Had a great start on the course, though. Good looking good out of ball two. Trouble into three, handle up high, and down she goes. So ending with that fall out the front, after the third buoy, the score, two and one half buoys at 38 off. Well, she has set the mark, though, Dave. That's gonna be a tough one to beat. Geraldine Jamin from Paris, but now residing in Florida, the next skier. Many people feel that she has the potential to really break it out into the forefront of women's slalom. A true technician, Joel. Absolutely, Dave. Look at uh, Geraldine as she comes around ball two at 35. Just stroking the course. Looking good at ball four. Great angle out of the turn. Absolutely perfect body position. No problem whatsoever as she rounds ball six for a full pass at 35 off and now to come back at the leader pass, 38 off. Appearing in her first Masters final competition, she has the full six buoys on that pass and how, now has an opportunity at 38 off, which was the pass we saw Tony Nibble fall. Well, two and a half is the score to beat here, Dave, and Geraldine has a great start, fantastic angle out of one. But trouble as she comes around ball two. Whoa, and taking a huge jerk from the boat, waiting for that slack to tighten up. As you can see, she did get a good start, managed to push that ski around, actually got pulled up just a little bit, and was not able to get the same width. Barely got around ball two and back to the wake for the full point. By getting to the center of the wake, however, she will score a full two buoys. While it's not enough to overtake Tony Nibble, she is sitting in second place with those two buoys at 38 off. We go to Karen Trulove, a North Carolina skier who has been here before, fought many times but never won here at the Masters. And Karen will soon be known as Karen Kruger. She is the fiance of Freddy Kruger, who of course is onshore watching 
as Karen works her way through the 35 off pass and looking strong as she works her way down toward the end, out around ball five, good angle, bit of trouble, but right back on it and out the end gate. Great looking pass, oh, six buoy. What a technician. You'll notice that Karen Trulove never gives up her body position. Even if there's slack in the rope, she always keeps her shoulders back. Well, <laughs> with the exception of that turn right there. Clearly a fighter. She's out there to get the job done and she did exactly that. With six buoys under her belt on that pass, the rope has been shortened. Here is the money pass as we know it so far. The leading score, two and a half. She's got to get a good start here. Right foot forward skier. And of course, Dave, that means that if Karen is able to get out to ball two in good shape, she's gonna hammer that turn and give herself a good shot at taking the lead. Great start, looks good out to two, manages to get around it. Out to ball three, we have a new leader, Dave. And back to the center of the wake, she's gonna get credit for three full buoys. Now, every slalom skier wants to go more than that. You know, she might not be satisfied, but she also knows that she's taken the lead with only one contestant remaining. Well, look how she managed the loose rope in order to get back to the wake. The score, 57 total buoys, and she takes the lead. When we come back, Christy Overton Johnson, the 1999 world champion in slalom skiing. Every year when the elite of water skiing arrive at Callaway Gardens for the Masters, the focus is on competition, but many also enjoy the wonders of nature that are in such abundance throughout this 14,000 acre preserve. Well, we're just so pleased that uh, in the years we've had the Masters, people have always come when you're so nice on television to talk about the gardens, and so we have something new to talk about this year. We're really excited. It's called the Virginia Hand Callaway Discovery Center. It is, um, it's everything that we've always needed. When you get here, you park your car here. You don't have to take your car anywhere. You walk from here. You can ride uh, bikes from here. You can, we have transportation centers to take you to all of the, the things we have, like the, the Johnny Sibley Horticultural Center, the Day Butterfly Center, the Vegetable Garden, things of that kind. But it's just so many fun things here together that they do. It's just something fun for everybody. And this center shows it all off. We all love coming to Callaway Gardens every year. The beauty off the water and the beauty on the water. We are in the midst of the women's slalom event. Karen Trulove is our leader, and she's on the dock with Dave. Karen, a score of three at 38 at the Masters is an awfully good score to come back to this dock with. How do you think it'll hold up? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, Christy's such an amazing skier, and she's got so many years of experience here and so many wins here. Um, but just kind of on a personal note, I am so happy with the way I ski that no matter how it turns out, if I get first or second, I do not care at this point because it's just been a tough year. I'm coming back from an injury and um, just had a hard time getting my head back on and being focused when I ski. And sorry, I'm so tired right now. I um, can't really talk. But um, I'm just I'm so excited. Just no matter what happens, I'm really excited with the way I skied. And top seeded Christy over to Johnson now on the water. She's got her work cut out for her. Three at 38 off is the score to beat. Let's keep in mind that Christy has some pressure on her. She has not made it into the finals here at the Masters for the last two years, rather unexplainably missing the finals. Now she's here, she wants to win. Well, certainly that is an oddity, but let's also keep in mind that this is the world solemn champion and many time Masters champion. Christy has got lots of experience, and she's showing us uh, just exactly how to put that experience to work as she wraps up 35 off. Karen True Love still back on the dock, going to watch every buoy here as Christy rounds them at 38 off. She needs to get some part of the fourth buoy to win this event. And that's not an easy task. To get to three is one thing. To get to four, you've got to be skiing for the whole course. She is going to be pushing and pushing. She is right out to ball four. Did she get back to the wake? We're looking for a final score, but Christy is looking very happy. Oh, the crowd reacts as Christy gets such a good start here. Tip coming around. Look at how early she is for ball two. She now has a shot at it if she just keeps working. And Christy is a fighter. She's down course a little bit at three, but she knows four is the right answer. She's going for it, and she has got it. She's our Masters champion in the Women's Solemn Event. And elated Christy is. 58 buoys, that's one better than Karen Trulove. Christy Overton, our Masters champion. Karen Trulove close behind with 57 buoys. Then Tony Neville and Geraldine Shaman. Christy, you've been on top here at the Masters so many times, and yet the last two years couldn't quite get to the finals even. And now here you are scratching your way back to a victory. What is that road like to come back? Well, it's just so sweet. This morning when I rode in the boat with my son, I just had tears in my eyes because, you know, I know what the Masters means to everybody. And I've realized this weekend just what an honor it is to be here and to ski here and 
and today I just wanted to relax and almost relax too much at 1 at 35 and I'm like oh well and I'm like why am I saying that I'm still in it so I'm just really thankful well the action continues when we come back here's Andy Mapple ready for slalom if you love water sports, then the Masters is the place to go for fun, sun, and excitement. Welcome back. The crowd has really witnessed a lot of great competition today, but there's more to come. But first, let's turn back and look at the women's tricks competition that was held earlier today. The ever-incredible and durable Tan Han clicking off the tricks. Two 20-second passes, and she knocked them down. She holds the world record at 8,630 points. She's a defending Masters champion. And man, does she stay close to this weight. What is it that makes Tan Han the champion time and time again? The more relaxed I can be, I've practiced getting, teaching myself to relax and be calm and training um, before I go out to ski to feel um, pumped up and then relax. That, that really helps. Tan Han getting a hug here from her sister. Ronnie Barton was second, but in men's tricks, Corey Picos carried the day. Corey Picos, truly a veteran of the Masters. You've done it again. I really thought it was going to take a bit. Nick's been skiing really good, and it's been a real close battle between us. And I went out before him, so I was going to do everything I could to put up a big score and, and make him work for it. Corey Picos breaking 11,000 points and winning his 10th Masters trick title. Well, back to the present is the men's slalom action. Andy Mapple is in the water, but Dave is talking to our leader, Chris Parrish. Chris, you come into the final round as top seed. What does it mean to you to be top seed? Well, being top seed, I think you know what you got to do. You know, it's a little bit more added pressure, but you know what you have to do. You know, I, I pulled it off in Moomba this year in front of 80,000 people, and I won, you know, being top seed. So there's no doubt in my mind that I can do it today. Andy Mapple's on the water at 38. Off, he's trying to catch Wade Cox, who's our current leader. He's got one and a half at 39 and a half off. And look at Andy work this course. Well, Andy is certainly the man that can do it. Looking strong as he comes around ball six and out the end gates at 38 off. He has won the title here 11 times. Chris Parrish concentrating, visualizing, imagining what he will be like and what he will be doing when he's out there after Andy. Here it is, 39 and a half off. Well, if anybody could do it, that would be Andy. Andy has the course record here on Robin Lake. Looks good coming out of two. A little bit narrow at three, not able to turn the ski standing up. Oh, a little bit of a surprise, Joel. He came into three, looked like he was in good shape, perhaps got a little cautious. I'm thinking Andy just might have opened the door for Chris Parrish, who's our top seeded skier coming into the finals. Right foot forward skier Andy Mapple is known for having no bad sides. He can turn the ski equally well on both sides of the course. And look at the incredible angle as Andy lays into it out of the turn, practically burying his shoulder, but does not get a turn at three. Nothing coming out of three. Stands up for the full point. Well, Chris Paris said it. He said, when you go out last, you know exactly what you have to do, but you also have a certain amount of pressure on you. Can the young man, Chris Parrish, at only 21 years of age, take on the master, Andy Mapple? Well, Chris is truly the new generation slalom skier. If you look at his style, it's almost perfect. He's right on top of the course, front to back, even at 38 feet off. For a tall man, he uses his knees incredibly well. Six buoys at 38 off. He has set himself up to go after this man, Andy Mapple. Will we have a new Masters champion? Well, Andy knows that Chris can run 39 off. He's done it many times. He's got to get some part of the fourth buoy. Here we go. A round number one, a left foot forward skier, a very big round turn. Trouble at ball two, breaks forward, and at 39 off, there is no room for error. Whoa! That is going to be a tough call, Dave. Stretching to the limit going out to ball four. Needs a chunk of four to get ahead of Andy. Did he do it? He's so late leaving the third buoy. Now watch him stretch here, but he lets go of the handle just before the tip of the ski gets to the buoy. That's what the judges will be watching for. So this is looking like a tie score. And it is. He has been given three buoys, and we're going to have to have a runoff. The ever-challenging Chris Parrish is face-to-face -face with Andy Mapple when we come back in a shootout. Welcome back to the men's shootout in men's slalom at Robin Lake. Chris Parrish is in the water, and earlier we asked him for some of his thoughts. 
Do you like this position going out first? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I'm not really worried about you know, where to go out at. I just want to go out and, you know, it's just do the best I can and sit back and see what happens. You know, that's all I can do right now. So it has been determined that Chris Parrish is off the dock first in the runoff. They go out at 38 off. He is really the underdog here, Joel. Some might wonder, who's he to challenge Andy Mapple? So true, Dave, and Chris may be wondering that himself. He didn't sound near as confident getting ready for the runoff as he did in the preliminaries. And Andy can't be real happy about Chris Parrish being top seed here in the finals. Well, Andy has the ultimate respect for this young man, though, because everyone knows that physically he has what it takes. Does he have what it takes mentally, though, to stand here and defeat Andy Mapple at the Masters course? And there's a good question, Dave, because we all know just how mentally tough this man is. Now Chris Parrish back on the water. And what a battle this is. The, the experienced skier against a lesser experience. A right foot forward against a left foot forward. And here it is, 39 and a half off. Let's see how far he can go. A good number one, but did not get a turn at ball two. Did he manage to get out and around ball three? Real nice start. Lots of angle out of one, but did not get his width out to two. Barely getting around two. Struggling to get out to three. Waiting to get back to the wake for the full point. Three buoys and a little disappointed. So has he left the door open now? Andy Mapple gets to go out last. He knows he's got to get some part of the fourth buoy. Remember, he's got to start at 38 off, though, and run that entire pass before he gets a chance at the money pass. Coming off the dock at a rope length that doesn't even reach the buoy. It's incredible, and Andy's been sitting around watching the action, so he's coming out literally cold. And he is stroking this pass, Dave. Look at this, he comes into six waiting for the buoy, takes a tug going out the gates. He's got a smile on his face because he's really relieved to have knocked down all six here. And he is happy to get this one behind him because he did have a few bobbles in the past right here as he came around ball five. Broke forward slightly, but he's a strong guy. Got right back on it and out to ball six to complete the pass at 38 off. So now coming in from the other end of the course, the rope has been shortened to 39 and a half off, but Chris Parrish knows that his destiny is in Andy's hands. Here it is, the first gate. Well, Chris has opened the door, Andy getting ready to close it. A great start at 39 and a half off, looking strong as he goes out to three, making a good turn, fighting to get out to four, but he gets the job done. Andy Mapple, Masters champion once again. Chris Parrish a little disappointed, Andy absolutely jubilant over this win, perhaps because it was a, a serious threat and from such a young competitor. Look at Andy's composure here. This comes from years of master's experience. There's where he could have made a mistake when he had only three, but he got on the edge so hard that he coasts around four and the party's over for Chris Parrish. Andy Mapple taking a victory lap for the crowd. You see the results there. When we come back, we've got an exciting event to wrap up the day. It's wakeboarding, and joining me will be Tony Finn. When you think about great tournaments, you think about the Masters. And when you think about great wakeboarders, you think about the name Bonifay. Today in the Masters Finals, we have four of the best wakeboarders in the world. Parks Bonifay, Darren Shapiro, Sean Murray, and for the first time ever, Parks' little brother, Shane Bonifay. So today, Parks is going to be looking over his shoulder at a face he's seen all his life. Coming up fast and strong, it's 16-year-old Shane Bonifay. Well, these rascals are on the dock right now. They're teasing each other, and they're getting ready to hit the water. It's wakeboarding when we come back. Welcome back, everybody, to ESPN's coverage of the 41st Masters Water Skiing and Wakeboard Tournament. Shane Bonifay getting ready to go big, and Dave's on the dock with Andy Mapple. Andy, I sense this is an emotional win for you. You've been here so many times, and yet this seems somewhat special. Yeah, I don't know really why. Just I guess the older you get, the more you come, just the more thankful you are to be here. And I, I can't tell you how thankful I am. Chris put up quite a fight, and he's a, a young guy chasing you right now. Yeah, you know, I mean, Chris is the future of the sport. You know, I mean, you know, I've had a great career, and, you know, I plan on sticking around a little longer, you know. But, you know, Chris obviously has tremendous talent, and he's going to win some Masters. There's no question. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, here's another young man that wants to win a Masters. It's his first Masters competition. He did compete in the Junior Masters, but believe it or not, 24 hours ago, he wasn't even sure he was going to be here, Tony. Yeah, he's really stoked to be here. He loves this tournament, and he says he doesn't have anything to lose. Look at that huge off-axis 360. Shane has really been improving his style. 
Well, he's had a great uh, subject to model himself after, referring to Parks. Yeah, Shane's been going big. He loves his pro model, and he's just ripping it up. You know, Shane Bonifay actually invented some tricks. And here's one right there. That's the Tootsie Roll. It's a reverse rotation trick, and he's one of the only guys who does it. Tony, take us through the strategy here on this first pass. Is he trying to throw hard tricks at the beginning or at the end? Shane's just trying to go huge. I don't know if he has as much strategy as some of the older guys. He figures he's in the Masters, he's in the Finals, and he's just going to go out there and blow up. So perhaps everything to win, nothing to lose may serve him well here. I absolutely agree. That was a nice whirly bird. Look at how he grabs that board. Holds it a Whoa. little bit longer than normal. Almost goes down. But he holds on. He's got a few more tricks left. He's getting off access a lot now. The judges like that. The tricks look a little, uh, look a lot different. That was an off access 540. And there's a dum dum, another trick that Shane Bonifay invented. This is one of the best passes I've ever seen from Shane Bonifay. He won his first professional event only in May of 99. So he's still really a rookie in this. Yeah, and he's been in his brother's shadow for a long time, and he's really coming into his own, and he's coming out of that shadow. Here's a double up. Boom! A big 720 for Shane Bonifay. He's got to be stoked with that double up. Oh, this brother Parks. This even fires him up. Sean Murray, they're cheering him on. Look at Shane as he comes into the double up. Grabs it. Huge rotation, two handle passes, and sticks to landing. Oh, my. That's going to be worth a lot in terms of his score. 75.68, and that's a big number. Something worth shooting for by this man, Darren Shapiro, 26-year-old Masters champion from 93 to 95, and the current world champion. He's sort of the Andy Mapple of wakeboarding. He's been here before. He knows what to do on the water. Hey, when you're going huge, safety's important. We asked Tony a little early to tell us about life jackets. When it comes to safety, he knows. In every sporting activity, there's some inherent danger. And it's no different in wakeboarding. I mean, when you jump, you can go pretty big. Now, some wakeboarders in the past decided not to wear vests, and that's just not that smart. Now, the vests are very flexible, and they're very easy to wear, and they don't restrict your movement at all. So when you go out wakeboarding, be cool, be smart, and wear a vest. Darren Shapiro, five times Masters champion. Do you think that experience is going to pay off here? Look at this. Well, it certainly is. Darren has nerves of steel. He still goes bigger than anybody. He carves into the wake harder than anybody. And he's showing you right now why he's won the Masters so many times. Look at the kind of width that he gets from side to side when he's still in the air. Yeah, I mean, he lands. 40 to 50 feet sometimes on the other side of the wake. It's unbelievable. I don't know any other wakeboarder that has the physique of this young man as well. No, he's, he's solid muscle, five feet of solid muscle. Let's go down to Shane. Tony's with him now. Shane, you absolutely stomped it out there in your first Masters final. I mean, tell me what you're thinking about out there. I can't even believe that. Like. I mean, I butt checked a lot of tricks, but that was by far the best run I've ever had. So I'm just stoked. I couldn't even believe I made that seven at the end of my run. Darren Shapiro, pass number two. He's got one more attempt to impress the judges here. Darren just living large out there. He knows what Shane did. He still has to go big, and he has to make it to the... Oh! Oh, my. man. It looked like he was trying an x mobe He was landing blind. And that was a brutal wipeout. Now, normally, you would see Darren waving right now to signify he's OK, and I don't see the wave yet. He comes in toe side right there, switch toe side, and the, t oh. the nose, which is the tail of the board, just lands and knifes right into the water. And that has got to hurt. That was a spectacular wipeout. Serious backlash for Darren Shapiro. Now, earlier today, we had the women wakeboarders, and Emily Copeland was on the water, a rider from Denver. The three women we had in the finals, Tara, Megan, and Emily, all went huge. Emily going down right there at the end of her second pass. And Tara Hamilton, a past Masters champion, really taking it big, but unfortunately went down there. But it was the 1999 world champion who held it all together. Megan Major from Claremont, Florida, mixed up a lot of nice maneuvers, especially the 360 off the double up. She carried the day. She won the event. You. Uh, Emily and Tara are just, just constantly pushing each other. It's really great to see. Yeah, it's, I'm really happy about it. I mean, women's wakeboarding definitely needs being pushed the way it is. And 
me, Tara, and Emily going out there every time, just stepping it up. It's great for the sport. It's great for women's wakeboarding and women's sports in general. Darren Shapiro has unscrambled his marbles. He's back on the water, but does he have enough? Most people would not be riding again. There goes Darren, 70.43 in second place right now. Well, Shane's mother's pretty excited here because Shane has dodged the Shapiro bullet, but there's two more gunning for him when we come back. ESPN's coverage of the 41st Masters is brought to you by Ford Outfitters, no boundaries. 23-year-old Sean Murray, he's got a lot of fans here at the Masters. He's a favorite because of his stylistic riding. Yeah, Sean's a great rider. Everybody loves the way he rides. Look at that star right there on that blind 360. Sean saw Shane ride just like everybody else. He knows he has to put up a big number here, and I'm not seeing the intensity from him that I'd like to see. So he's gonna have to take it up a notch. There's the whirly bird. Now that's a good one. Let's go down to the dock. Tony's with Darren. Darren, I have to say that was one of the most spectacular wipeouts I've ever seen. Tell me what happened on that skeezer. I was just trying to do everything in the run as big as I could do it. The handle got away from me. I got pulled on my heels. And uh, just one of those good bell ringers. So what hurts right now in your body? My ego. <laughs> and correctly stated because this is an important event. Second pass for Sean Murray. Going a little bit bigger on that one. That was huge. That was a railing to blind. It's called the blind judge. He gets a nice grab right there on the board. Wrapping Come, up now. He's coming in wrapped. That's a wrap KGB. Sometimes you see guys do it without a wrap. In this particular case, Sean went for it in the wrap version. There's a Scarecrow Mobius. And whoa, whoa. Sean almost going down right there. But holds on. A little more energy in this second pass, Tony. A little bit more, but I, I still think he doesn't have quite enough yet. He's going to have to go huge on the double up if he wants to overtake Shane Bonifay. And here's Parks Bonifay getting ready. He looked over to the pavilion, probably saw Shane egging him on. A big double up right here may be enough for a victory. He's going for the 900. Oh, he goes down. He cased the top of the wake. Look at the revolutions here. He's coming in toe side. Good extension, goes big, but he does not get quite enough rotation. It goes down. Sean Murray swimming in after earning 70.71 points. Not enough to overtake our leader. Shane has dodged another bullet. But he's got a huge, gigantic bullet to dodge now. There's Betty Bonifay. Do you think she cares if Shane or Parks wins, or she's just happy to be here? <laughs> she's a true promoter of the sport. She wants a winner in the family, though. Last year, the 99 Masters. Take a look at this double up by Parks Bonifay. That was the giant half cab double back roll. And then, just for fun, Parks goes over the ramp and does a tantrum off it. Oh, my. Here comes Parks now. He's clowning around. He jumps over Sean Murray and his board in the middle of the lake. Parks trying to loosen up here, trying to fend off whatever pressure he might be feeling. Let's go down to Tony. Talk to me about your relationship with your brother. I mean, what would it mean for you if you beat him here today? I actually was talking to him, and he said that He'd want me to win just so I can have the feeling of winning Masters again. A defending Masters champion from last year, Parks Bonifay is on the water with pass number one. Started off with the big off-axis 540. Nice, Pete Rose, Parks looks focused. If Parks puts his best pass together, he has enough to beat Shane. But he has to go big. He has to do his best absolute pass. That was a nice grab right there. There's really no way you dare go cautiously here. Oh, oh, Parks almost goes down there. You have to go big. Shane put up a big number. Look at that blind landing for Parks. There's his whirly bird. Nice first pass. Good style for Parks. Turns the board to Fakey. And then it looked like his rail caught a little bit, but he held on. Do you think he starts feeling the pressure now with one pass to go? He might be. I mean, at one part of him probably wants his brother to win. The other part, he wants to take home the money and win the Masters himself. He must be feeling a dichotomy right now. Big front flip with a nice grab. Coming in, toe side. Oh! He tried a blind landing, and it bounced him, and he just went down. 
So about halfway through that second pass, Parks what makes what may be a fatal mistake. Now look at that blind landing. Look at the way his face is facing totally behind him. He's not even looking at the boat. That's a very difficult trick. Uh, I think he's cheering on his brother. Shane's already getting a congratulatory hug from mom. Now he can go big on the double up and he's going for this all around throwdown award which is being presented by Wakeboarding Magazine for the coolest trick. Whoa my, oh, he loses the handle. So Shane Boniface is gonna win the Masters, but Parks Boniface is gonna win the Wakeboarding Magazine all around throwdown award for that trick even though he lost the handle. So clean, he swims back in with 67.40 points Coming up short of Brother Shane. While we're waiting for the final results, let's take a look at what happened in the overall race, where the combined score of slalom, trick, and jump is added together to declare a winner. Sarah Gaudissant won the women's overall title at the Masters. And it was Jarrett Llewellyn coming back once again with a superb trick run to match up his great jumping and take the overall in the men's division. It was his fifth. Shane Bonifay is the winner of the 41st Oh, there it is. It's official. Shane has won. Let's go down to Tony. All right, Shane, we just found out you're the Masters champ. How you? What do you think right now? Oh, it's killer. I'm yeah. stoked. Killer? Killer. Now, Parks, what about you? I mean, you know, you've always done, you've always beat Shane almost every single time. What about today? I don't know. He just edged me out. I fell, but he had a killer run. I don't know if even if I would have made my double, if I would have still won, but, uh, I, best, I guess I better get used to him beating me, so I'm getting used to it. There's the final results. Bonifay followed by Murray Shapiro and the other Bonifay. And mom and family take a dunking. Well, it's no surprise the 41st Masters was like all other Masters, a certain amount of pressure and a certain amount of excellence that brings the prize home to those who are the toughest, those who are durable. Some have been here before, and for others, it was a first-time win. Hey, for Tony Finn and Joel McClintock, I'm Dave Benzel. The 41st Masters has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, part of the Go Network. Go.com.